I wanted to mention this too, because this is like kind of a powerful moment, powerful thing too, is that we, uh, all the decorations you see were all donated by three churches, one in York, one right here in Lidditz, and then uh, another church actually all the way in Chicago, uh, a former ministry of mine that really believes in what we're doing here, uh, packaged up a giant box of stuff and shipped it to us here in, in Mannheim. And uh, so I just want to give God praise for that too, for the way that he, he worked all that out. Because decorations, I think, in VBS is part of the fun for the kids to see that, see the place all decked out. And I uh, just wanted to say I'm thankful for that. Well, wh one of the times we were picking up decorations, me and another gentleman by the name of Brandon, I'm going to throw him under the bus. He's not here today. We were picking up decorations. We actually took two truckloads, okay? He had his tr back of his bed, the bed of his truck and a trailer. We filled it up two times, uh, driving over to Lidditz to get decorations. And one of those times we had both of these things right here in the back of our truck, in the back of his trailer. And... I, I thought for an instance, we, you know, we probably should strap it down. <laughs> and, but you know what? It was jammed in there pretty good. You know how you do. You get some cardboard and you jam it in there so it, there's no room, room for it to slide or fly. Well, we got down about a mile down from the church and I said, just go slow, take it easy. He's like, yeah, well, he forgot, I guess. <laughs> and, 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 he takes off. No, he didn't take off, but he went faster. And next thing you know, this thing, right? I don't know which one it is. It's either this one or that one back there. I'm not sure which one it is, to be quite honest with you. But all of a sudden, it's floating like 20 feet in the air and spinning at the same time, like it's in a tornado vacuum or something. And uh, it landed on its side, and boom, so we laughed. I said, this is what memories are made of. And <laughs> we ran out. Got, got it. It was dented up a little bit. We were able to kind of repair it, and we had a good laugh about that. Well, we are going to laugh about that for a long, long time. So he said, yeah, you know, I was thinking of using the straps in my truck, but I didn't. And I said, yeah, okay, let's get those out. <laughs> so we got the straps out, and we did that, and uh, I'm just, you know, thankful for Brandon and uh, his support and encouragement and friendship, um, but helping me with decorations. Uh, I'm thankful for that. So, but... I say that to say that when it comes to the, the transporting decorations uh, test, if you will, if you let me call it that, we failed. <laughs> we failed that test, and I know that, um, that we have several teachers in our midst who are not going to want me to hear me say this, but school is starting soon, and maybe there are some parents who are rejoicing that school is starting soon, I don't know. But we are, uh, but it's the end of summer, and I don't know if you have similar uh, thoughts and anxiety around rem remembering and thinking back on when you would take a test. Anybody like just dread the, the exams and tests that you would take? I got a few people. I know that there's test anxiety. I saw one of my friends uh, on social media is a teacher in Ohio, and he was like prepping for the first day, got my presentation already, and it was like, you know, Mr. So-and-so, da-da-da, da-da-da, pop quiz. And I thought, oh my word, you animal. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was a simple pop quiz, but, but tests, you know, the, the book of Hebrews, we've been kind of going through the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, and we've been seeing, looking at individuals who are here, if you haven't been with us, that's fine. Individuals who are, were known for the way that they lived by faith. And there's one individual in particular who experienced several, what I'll call tests. And I'll say that because it comes right from, from the actual scripture. Several tests over the course of his life. And uh, none bigger than the test that we will uh, see him experience today. And um, his name, of course, was Abraham. And Hebrews eleven seventeen says that, that by faith, Abraham, when God tested him. So God is actually the one who tested Abraham, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. So did Abraham pass the test? Well, if you know scripture, you know the story. But 
we're going to go through it. But the, but the biggest thing to me is that I want us to be thinking through is, <laughs> is what can we learn from that story? Because each of us have seasons and moments where we face a test. Where God is taking us through a season where we face a trial. And I think we're going to learn, I, I really believe we're going to learn from, from Abraham's example. And how he um, made it through that test and even passed that test. We'll find out from Abraham's example. So before we dive in, I think it's, it's important for us to kind of do some recapping, some, some biographical work on Abraham, if you will. And we know... Um, that this is our third message on Abraham um, in our Living by Faith series. And that's significant because in, in, in Galatians chapter 3, it tells us that Abraham uh, believed God. That he had faith and it was credited to him as righteousness. And it says after that that everyone else that has faith is Abraham's child. Isn't that interesting? So essentially, in my mind, he's the father of faith. We first hear about Abraham in Genesis chapter, chapter 12. When see, I'm going to trip over these things one of these days. If I, go, if I fall, it's okay. I give you permission to laugh. Genesis chapter 12 is when we kind of first hear about Abraham, when God kind of out of nowhere, okay, really, we don't have much context, calls Abraham away from his home, his family, everything that he's known, and says, I'm calling you to something greater, and ask, tells him to, to leave his home. And, this, and uh, we learned that last week that his wife Sarah was barren. She was unable to have children. And this detail of Abraham's faith story is significant because Along with God calling him away from his home, God also told him five different times in the book of Genesis that he was going to make Abraham into a great nation. And that all the nations of the world would be blessed through Abraham. This one man. Isn't that significant? In fact, and I think this is so interesting, a few weeks ago we spent the week at the beach in South Carolina and uh, we went out a few, one night in particular, and, and just look up at the stars in, it, in the dark of the, of the beach. And uh, they have, um, it's, the beach where we go is actually a, a, a kind of a hotbed for loggerhead turtles. They'll come up, they'll lay their eggs, and then the eggs will hatch. And we actually stumbled upon a, a nest that was hatching a number of years ago. And it was spectacular. You have to ask Jennifer about the story about when she was taking a picture of her parents with the light of the moon in the background, and a turtle was coming up out of the water. <laughs> a giant loggerhead turtle. I have to ask her about that. But because of that, there's no light. You can't have lights out on the beach. And so the stars that you can see. Well, one time Abraham was doubting, uh, you know, was just questioning. Like, this promise, God, that you're making me, like, I just wonder. And God, and we don't know exactly how, but somehow God took him outside and said, look up at the stars. Try counting the stars. And of course, you can't count all the stars. If you've ever been in a, in a dark night with lots of stars, starry night, and he says, that's how many descendants you're going to have. Another part of his story is he said, the sand on the seashore, talking about the beach, and he said, if you were to count the grains of sand, so shall your descendants be. So that's part of Abraham's story is he leaves his home. His wife, Sarah, is unable to have children. The other thing is, too, actually, this is significant, too, is that Genesis actually describes Abraham's age in a very fascinating way. They say he's good as dead. <laughs> so Abraham was of the age around 100 when he finally had his son, Isaac. 
And Sarah was 90. So any, I don't know if you know any 90-year-olds that are having babies these days, but I don't think we have many of those. See, God called him. He said, I'm going to make you into a great nation. But there was a problem. If he was going to make Abraham into a great nation, Abraham needed an heir, a child. So there were other things that happened over the course of that time, and, and, and we'll get into how each of those things, I believe, were tests that God was putting Abraham through in order to refine him, to make him stronger for this ultimate test that we'll look at today. But he didn't always pass. He failed some tests. If you know the, the, the account of Hagar and Ishmael, then you know that Abraham did not always pass the test. But God had made a promise to Abraham, but there was no child. Well, if you know scripture, eventually Sarah um, becomes pregnant and has a son. They name him Isaac, which means he will laugh. Now, What's interesting about that is that there are several moments in Genesis where when God or a, a, a messenger tells Abraham and Sarah that they're going to have a child at their old age when they're good as dead, <laughs> they both laugh because they're like, you can't, it's almost like they're doubting God. He's putting them to the test. And... So when Isaac's born, they name him Isaac, which means he will laugh as a reminder to them that you should never doubt God. See, Abraham and Sarah didn't know this when they laughed, but God's in the business. He truly is in the business of taking situations and circumstances that feel impossible and, and, and by his power miraculously and supernaturally turning them for his ultimate glory and for our good. The same is really, honestly, is true about God today. I see it in my life. That God, he's truly a God who is in the business. I like to say in the business because I feel like that makes sense to our minds. He's in the business of taking impossible situations. Maybe you find, you, you have, you find yourself today in maybe one of those situations that feels like, you're boxed in. It's like, I got nowhere else to go. I, and there's no, I don't have, there's no out here. And I'm going to encourage you that, that there is a God out there who loves you, who cares about you, and who is in the business of taking our impossible situations and miraculously turning them for his glory and our good. It's about seeking him. It's about releasing control. I feel like as I get older, I, I tend to want to take more control of my life and my, and my circumstances. When in the reality, as we grow and mature and as our character develops and as we grow closer to the, to the Lord, we should release control. I haven't learned that lesson yet. I don't always pass that test. But we're going to look at Hebrews 11, those three verses in Hebrews 11. We're going to look at Genesis 22, which is the account of Abraham and Isaac. You can grab the Bible in front of you. The scripture, most of the scripture we're going to be looking at will be on the screen as well. You can look on the screen, that's fine. Or your devices, however you'd like to look. But we begin by looking at Hebrews 11:17, as we've read already. But it says, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. What? No, I thought he was going to make him into a great nation. Now, how is he going to sacrifice Isaac, his only heir, when he's good as dead? <laughs> that was the first step toward making Abraham into a great nation. Well, let's, let's move on to 17b. He, he who had embraced the promises, that's Abraham, was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it's through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Well, we need to gain some significant context here, and we can do that in Hebrews 11 by, by flipping back to Genesis 22. So we're going to do that and spend a good chunk of time in Genesis 22. We're going to see the test that Abraham, that God put Abraham through, and, and Scripture is very clear about that. In Genesis 22, it begins by saying, sometime later... God 
tested Abraham. Another translation actually says, God tested Abraham's faith. You know, this concept of testing is really all throughout Scripture. The Lord tested, uh, it says in Exodus, the Israelites, when they were wandering around the desert after escaping Egypt. And in fact, in Luke chapter 4, and this is so interesting to me, this is the way the Lord works sometimes. And, and I had some, always try to have some my own quiet time before the Lord on, on every day, but Sunday mornings in particular. Been a trip. In my... In my, uh, it was not planned, but my passage that I was reading this morning, my scripture this morning, was about Jesus and his temptation and being tested. But Luke chapter 4 talks about when Jesus was led into the, into the wilderness to be tempted. And the devil tempted him three times, and, and, and essentially that was Jesus being put to the test. But when God tests us, and if you're experiencing a test, hopefully this is helpful for you. I really think uh, he tests us, he wants to reveal, um, for two reasons he's testing us, excuse me. He wants to reveal something to us, and he wants to refine something in us. Reveal and refine. Testing uh, times of testing and trials truly reveal to us really what's actually in our hearts when those challenges come. When the testing comes, what, what's, my, what's my mindset? What's my attitude? What do my actions reveal about my heart? Testing reveals a lot about our faith. How strong is our faith? And God sometimes uses tests. I'm using the word test because of our text, because of our scripture today, but really it's trial too. But he uses tests in our faith to reveal areas of our lives that need some refining. For example, and I use my kids as an example a lot, and I don't think they're quite the age. I'm not sure what age. I can't do that anymore. I think I, think I had a pastor friend that said, once they reached a certain age, you just had to give them a dollar every time you used them in an illustration. So maybe I'm, I might have to do that. I don't know. But God has given me an ongoing test for the last nine years that has revealed again and again that I'm not quite as patient as I thought I was. It's called my kids. <laughs> That my fuse isn't quite as long as it, I, it was or I thought it was before kids. This is a safe place, right? I can admit that, can't I? But God gives us tests, I believe, to reveal something to us and to refine something in us. Listen to this, uh, these verses in 1 Peter. He says, even though you must endure many trials for a little while, these trials will show you that your faith is genuine. It is being tested. Listen to this. As fire tests and purifies gold, if you know that process, we won't get into that. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold, so when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Imagine what our lives would be like if we didn't go through anything. If your faith was never challenged, if life never got hard, if you never had any confusion, any questions, any angst, any difficulty. On the surface, it's like, yeah, sure, sign me up for that life. I'd like that. Sign me up. I'll take that. No testing, no trials, no hardships. But if you've ever experienced those times, you know that when your faith is tested, when your life, when you experience a, a difficult season, a challenge, it's when, in those moments, when your faith grows the most. Without the testing and the trials, what would your life be like? I imagine your life would be easier without the tests. True in all of our lives, but it probably wouldn't be quite as fruitful. Because tests purify your faith and increase your fruitfulness. So God uses these periods of, of testing to, uh, to reveal and to refine us. It's like a professional sports team, you know, who is, has a lot of younger players, and they go through the playoff process, and, the, and the, 
the pressure of playoff, uh, the, whatever sport they're playing. And then years down the road, they do it again, and they're more seasoned, and they're calm, and they don't let it overwhelm them because they've had that experience. Well, the same is true for us. So let's get a little practical here for a minute. I love to get practical. I, I'm a very simple person. I think simply about these things. But I just want to ask, if, are you experiencing right now a season of, of testing? Are you going through something today that has caused you to really question? God, what are you doing? It's important to ask the right question. So what does this test or trial reveal? For example, the silly story I shared about my kids, about my patience with my kids and my few, to a greater degree, I believe God tests me as a parent to show me that no matter how much I try, I'm not in full control over my kids. They have their own mind and their own will. I can raise my voice. I can get firm with them, but sometimes they just don't listen. <laughs> so what's God revealing in me that I'm not in control, that he's in control? I need to surrender to him. What needs to be refined in me? Well, I need to work on responding with more care and patience with my kids. So God chose to test Abraham's faith in order to reveal and to refine. And what greater test for Abraham than for God to tell him to sacrifice his son, the son he loves. So Genesis 22, sometime later, God tested Abraham, we've seen already. He said to him, Abraham, here am I, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain where I will show you. So one thing that's interesting about this test, I think it's important to point out, is that I think it's important to point out that ultimately this uh, should give us hope and encouragement. And that, that we learned that up to this point in Abraham's life, he's faced a lot of tests. Remember when God told him, called him out of his home, what was comfortable? Remember when God said, you're going to have a child, even though you're good as dead? And we know from Abraham's story, from his biography, that Abraham did not always pass those tests. It's encouragement to me. Abraham was called repeatedly. But Abraham, his faith had been built up over the years with these tests, refined with these tests. So sacrificing Isaac may be the extreme and an intense test if we think about it. But God didn't start there. So as the tests get more intense, Abraham, Abraham had the stamina to endure. So whatever you might be going through today, we know this one thing about God. Well, we know more than one thing, but here's one thing for you. That God will not ever give you more than you can handle. God will not give you more than you can overcome and make it through. And he'll give you exactly what you need to do so. I found this uh, quote from Charles Spurgeon, and I think it's, it really fits. It says, The Lord knows how to educate you up to such a point that you can endure in years to come what you could not endure today. Just as today he may make you, st just as today he may make you to stand firm under a burden which ten years ago would have crushed you into dust. wonder if that's kind of why, in a lot of ways, why Abraham didn't really push back when God said that. In fact, we'll see in, in verses that he gets up right away and obeys. In verse 3 of Genesis 22, it says, Early the next morning, he didn't wait till the afternoon. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. Abraham obeyed. The writer of Hebrews says that faith is the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance of what we don't see. One author said it this way. In other words, faith is an inner certainty regarding things you can't see that engages your will, leading you to action. Faith, the confidence of things hoped for, the assurance of things not seen. Now, if I was Abraham, I probably would say, 
you want me to sacrifice my son, can I sacrifice a different son? Not, just not Isaac. Please, not Isaac. Verse 4 of Genesis 22. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I go, while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we'll come back to you. There's another point of his faith. He said, I'll come back to you. So he tells his servants, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering, placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the, knife and the fire and the knife. He tells his servants, he'll come back. In verse 17, we'll skip forward. We know what, what happens. They go up there, and just before uh, Abraham sacrifices Isaac, we know the angel stops him and says, no, your faith, uh, your faith stands. And after that, they find a, a ram in the thicket, and, and Abraham calls that place, that mountain, uh, the, mount, the place that God provides. And it's interesting that, that that's the rhythm of, of, this, of this text because, because what, in, in a test that you may be experiencing now, a testing of your faith, I want to encourage you that there is a God, that we have a God, that we worship a God who will provide what you need to make it through. Someone here this morning really needs to hear that, I believe. Someone here this morning needs to hear that whatever you have going on or what you're experiencing right now in this moment, that we worship and we have a God who provide, who's the provider God, who provides for you exactly what you need. He will do the same for you. You just need to trust him. And always, the providing, the providing might not always look or feel the way we want it to feel. We may have a certain idea in our mind, but he will provide. So here's a few things to wrap up that I want us to walk away with. That God tested Abraham. He told him to sacrifice his son whom he loves. And it my heart was so touched this week as I was looking at this, some of these scriptures. And it just reminded me, you know, there's a, there was another father in scripture who had, was called to sacrifice his son. And it was God himself. His son that he sacrificed? Jesus. But this father, God the Father, wasn't experiencing a test. He sent his one and only son to the cross so that you and I could have forgiveness and experience true life in him. Some of you might be here today and, and maybe you've never made a decision to say, I want to follow Jesus with my life. I'm a sinner in need of a savior. Sin is just the wrong things that we've done. Some of you maybe have never done that. Or maybe you did it a long, long time ago, and it's like, I have not my faith. I'm not serious about my faith. Some of you have been trying to go through life on your own. You've been trying to control it. You've been trying to keep hold of it. And I do that all the time. And I have to be constantly reminded that it's Jesus who I need to surrender to. We know that God the Father gave his son for us. Scripture says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. He didn't have others. His one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for it's by grace you've been saved through faith. It's a gift of God. Sometimes we think, well, we need to, I'm going to get my act together, and then I'll come to Jesus. Or, I, if I do enough good, then maybe I'll be in right standing with God. But that's not what Scripture teaches. 
It says, for it's by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not from yourselves. It's not because of what I've done. It's a gift to God. So we've seen Abraham's test. We've seen his test of faith. We've seen that a test is in order to reveal and to refine. I just want to ask you how your faith is today as we conclude. How's your faith today? How's your heart today? Have you ever made a decision to follow Jesus with your life? It doesn't take a special prayer. It doesn't take getting, out, getting your act together. Well, I'm gonna, I need to get my ducks in a row, and then I, and I'll come to Jesus. It takes a willingness to admit my wrongdoing and to recognize that I'm in need of a Savior, and that's Jesus. Are you experiencing a season of testing right now? A, 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 a trial? A, a season where, where you are... Uh, maybe it feels like you're holding on by a thread. There's hope in Jesus. Matthew 11 tells us, this is Jesus actually talking. It says, come to me, come to Jesus. It's, that's what he's saying. When you're experiencing that test that feels like it's going to swamp you. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Jesus is saying that. Come to me, all you who are weary of your burden. Maybe you're in a test right now like Abraham was. Maybe God is trying to reveal and refine your faith. Maybe it's just time for you to come to Jesus. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I want to give you a, just a moment right now with God. Just you and the Lord, one on one. I'm not gonna. I won't say much. I'll leave it between the two of you. Only you know what's inside your heart this morning. But my best guess is that if we were to go around the room, each one of us could share about something, an experience, a test of sorts that we're experiencing right now. So I want to encourage you to give that to God. It's long past due to give your life to the Lord, to give your circumstances over to Him, to cast your cares on Him because He cares for you. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. It's beautiful. And I will give you rest. If you aren't sure exactly what to say, maybe you've never done that before, it's easy to say, Jesus, I need you. I need your help. That's as simple as that. I'm going to encourage you right now Take a moment with the Lord. Jesus, thank you for your, your word. Thank you for truly, Lord, the hope that we have in you. The hope that can withstand all the seasons and challenges and tests of life and trials. You encourage us to come to you and that you will give us rest. That we can cast our cares on you, Jesus. And it's scripture says, you care for us. Unreal. The God of the universe cares for me. He loves you. He wants a relationship with you. He wants you to surrender to him. Your trials, your challenges, your life. And it's in Jesus when you'll find where you'll find hope and freedom 
and grace and mercy and forgiveness. It's in Jesus where you will find hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.